calling all cars. A copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Hello. This is Percy, Martin. Oh, hello, dear. I've got to see you, Martin. 
Well, why didn't you drop over? I'll be here. No. I want to see you alone. You'll have to meet me somewhere. Well, I can't do that. I've got some friends coming in this evening. You're meeting me, do you understand? Oh, but Percy, I... You wouldn't want any trouble, would you? Oh, no, no, don't do that. All right, then. Well, where shall I meet you? The corner of 6th Avenue and West Jefferson. Very well, I'll, I'll be right out. Yeah, more like it, Mark. Goodbye. Goodbye. What's the trouble, Mother? You look worried. Oh, oh, oh it's nothing. Who is that on the phone? Uh, just a friend of mine. Aren't you going to finish your dinner, Mother? No, I, I don't feel like it. I'm, I, I'm not that hungry now, and I... I have to go out for a while anyway. Are you going to be gone long? No, I'll be back in about a half hour. The students are dropping in, you know. Well, I wish you'd do one thing, Mother. What's that? And please don't wear all those diamonds. Why not? It isn't safe. Philip's right, Maud. You risk your life every time you go out with that small fortune on your fingers. Oh, that's silly. No, it isn't, Mother. It makes me nervous every time you go out alone at night. Well, even if it is dangerous, I'm not going to stop wearing my diamonds. I love them. Well, if you insist on wearing them, let me go along with you. Oh, no, no you can't do that. Why not? I've got some business to do, uh, a personal business. Oh, very well, then. But I wish you'd leave those diamonds at home. They're going to get you in trouble one of these nights. A few moments later, Mrs. Kennedy meets the man who telephoned her. The rendezvous is in what at that time is a thinly settled section of town. The houses are few and far between. The streets dimly lit. Oh, Percy, what is it this time? I've got to have some money, man. Oh, I thought so. I suppose you spent that five dollars I lent you yesterday. Yeah, it's nearly gone. I've got to have more. I'm going to get married. Get married? How can you get married? Well, you haven't even got a job. Well, I don't care. I'm in love with a girl and I want to marry her. I'll get a job somewhere. You've got to give me the money to get married on. I can't. I haven't any money. Oh, come on now, Ma. Don't hand me that. I haven't, Percy. I'm broke. They came in your poker the other night. Ma, did you understand what I said? I've got to have money. You, uh, wouldn't want me to tell Philip about all that dough you lose at poker, would you? Oh, oh you wouldn't. I might. Your little boy wouldn't think so highly of his mother then, would he? Oh, Percy, don't do that. Please don't. Yeah, it's worth something to keep me quiet, isn't it? Yes, I, I suppose it is, but... I've been telling you the truth. I really haven't got any money, really. Well, how about those diamonds? We could sell a couple of them. That'd be all I need now. Sell my diamonds? Oh, no, no, I can't do that. Well, those diamonds mean everything to me. Yeah, I know. I guess they mean more to you than your own son's opinion of you, eh? Huh? I, I can't see how you can treat me like this after all I've done for you. I, I don't think you're a shame of mine. Well, I am. Maybe I'm a little too hasty. I know how you feel about your diamonds. I sort of thought, though, that I could depend on you. Well, if you haven't any cash, well, that's that. But would you understand how it is? Don't you tell me? Oh, sure. Let's forget all about it. And you won't tell Philip anything? No. What kind of a guy do you think I am? <laughs> well, just to show you I'm a friend of yours, I, I bought some perfume for you with the last of that money you gave me yesterday. Perfume? Oh, well, that's nice of you, Percy. Uh, here it is. You want to smell it? Oh, I'd love to. Yeah, take it with. Oh, that's funny. Oh, this is the door. Think it off. Think it off. Think it off. Think it off. Put it down your throat and then you'll go to sleep. Yeah, nice long sleep. Get you back on this vacant lot here where no one's liable to find you for a while. I, I knew you'd be wearing the ice, Mona. Mm. I could depend on that, couldn't I, my dear friend? Mm. <laughs> you got all of it on. Even the one I pawned to you. That's nice, Maud. Mm. Now, if you don't mind, I'll relieve you, will you? I don't think you'll need them where you're going. I'll just leave you that wedding ring and a couple of small sparklers so it won't look like robbery. Mm -hmm. Well, Maud. Thanks, old kid. So long. The body of Mrs. Kennedy is not discovered until the next day. 
The police doctor has already examined the body when Captain of Detective J.A. Wynn arrives on the scene from headquarters. Back there. Now stand back there. Well, Doctor, what's the diagnosis? Strangulation induced by ammonia or a similar liquid swallowed with suicidal intent. There really was no reason for you to come out. Just an ordinary suicide. What makes you think so? Well, there's no evidence of criminal assault. No signs of a struggle. Robbery was not the motive for she's wearing two diamond rings and a wedding band. Obviously, it's suicide. Perhaps. But if it's suicide, can you explain what happened to her shoe and her glove? Observe that they're missing? Oh, I uh, hadn't noticed that. I uh, see. Well, suppose we look around a bit. All right. <clears throat> ah, here they are, Doctor. A clump of weed. A shoe, a string of seed, and a glove. Well, oh, there are plenty of food from the body. Look. I should say the way these weeds are trampled down would indicate quite a struggle. Wouldn't you, Doctor? Well, maybe. No. <clears throat> now, this woman had committed suicide on the spot where the body was found. How did the slipper and the glove and the beads get here? On the other hand, if she was murdered at this spot, why was the body moved over there? I'm not at all satisfied that this is, that this is the case of suicide. I'm going to work on the assumption that it's murder. <laughs> Captain Wynn's conviction, the coroner pronounces the death of suicide. Through a safe deposit box key found on her person, the victim is identified as Mrs. Maud Kennedy. Captain Wynn has the unfortunate task of breaking the news to Mrs. Kennedy's son and daughter-in-law. After they have recovered somewhat from the shock of Wynn's tragic announcement, the detective questions. I'm terribly sorry to intrude upon your grief like this, but you realize, of course, how important it is to get at the bottom of this thing as quickly as possible. Naturally, Captain... Why do you say you don't believe in this suicide theory? That's ridiculous. Mother would never commit suicide. Well, I don't believe she did. Under the circumstances of the discovery of the body, I think she was murdered. Oh. I'm sorry to be so blunt. Forgive me. Now, will you please tell me what happened the last time you saw her? Well, she had dinner last night when she was called to the phone. From the conversation, it seemed she knew the party well. And she left the table and went out, saying she wouldn't be long. Did your mother wear any other jewels than the two diamond rings found on her fingers? Yes, plenty of them. Diamonds were her weakness. <laughs> she was known around here as a lady of the diamonds. I wonder often about wearing them. I, I wonder why she was not like that. No, Mr. Kennedy, please. Try to control yourself. It's most important that we get to the bottom of this thing, you know. I'm sorry. I'll do my best. Do you know of anyone who might have a motive other than robbery for her murder? No. Everyone loved Mother. Had she had any disagreements with anyone? No. Had she reported any strange or suspicious happenings in her life recently? No. She, she likes everyone. Everyone likes her. Well, Mr. Kennedy, could you give me a list of the diamonds that your mother wore when she left the house? Uh, yes, sir. Think, let me see. It was a four-carat solitaire. <laughs> Returning to headquarters, Captain Wynn finds Charles Whitehead, chief nurse at the receiving hospital, waiting for him. Hello, Charlie. What's on your mind? Ah, that Kennedy case. Something I think you ought to know. What is it? Well, about 10 o'clock last night, a young fellow came into the hospital and asked if Mrs. Maud Kennedy had been injured. I asked him if Mrs. Kennedy was his wife, and he said no, it was his mother. Yeah. Yeah, I told him that no one with that name had been brought in, and he thanked me and left. Oh, that's peculiar. That's right. Oh, thanks for the tip, Charlie. I'm going to call up Kennedy and see if he was the guy. Okay, oh, Captain. Give me Jefferson 230W. Hello, Mr. Kennedy. Captain Wynn speaking. Say, I just got a report that a young man claiming to be Mrs. Kennedy's son inquired about her at the receiving hospital last night. Did you go down there? You didn't? Oh, I see. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. <laughs> Dispatching detectives to search the neighborhood of the scene of the crime, Captain Wynn succeeds in discovering two witnesses who had heard the groans of Mrs. Kennedy. Their stories coincide and establish the time of the murder as approximately nine o'clock. Investigations among Mrs. Kennedy's many friends reveals a young woman who had been an intimate companion of the slain woman. Captain Wynn and his aide interview her. I, I just can't imagine who would do such a thing. Well, Miss Robertson, think now. 
Was there anyone who had a grudge against Mrs. Kennedy? No, I, I don't think so. But there was a kid, Riley. Who's kid, Riley? Well, he was a uh, prize fighter. He was very much in love with Maud, and she was a little afraid of him because he had such a compelling uh, influence on her. Of course, she realized he wasn't her kind, and yet he held a fascination for it. She couldn't escape. Possibly he's the man we're after. Prize fighter, huh? And she was filled with chloroform or ammonia. Pneumonia is used a lot around doctor's training quarters. Boys, I want you to go out and find this kid, Riley. I don't know what's come over the kid lately. Look at them smack that sparring partner. This noise seems to be flat. Uh, well, don't worry about the kid. He's been kind of worried about Joe. You snap out of it. Well, uh, I forgot to tell you, there's a big guy waiting on the dressing room to see him. It's like a drink. Yeah, Riley's always in some kind of trouble. wonder what it is this time. Hey, Riley, lay off that guy before you kill him. Hey, what's the matter with you, Al? Gee, everything I, everything I do is wrong. Now what is it? Ain't nothing wrong, kid. Hold on to your noise. Bill says there's a guy who wants to see you in the dressing room. Yeah, well, if it's one of them newspaper guys, I ain't interested. I need all the dough I got right yeah, now. But this mug looks like a dick. A dick? Well, well, tell him I'm busy. Tell him anything. Come I'm on, busy. Ted. Let's see what it's all about. Oh, okay. I ain't done nothing. I'll see him. <laughs> Did you want to see me, pal? Yes, just want to ask you a couple of questions. Oh, I know. Now, listen. I, I didn't have nothing to do with that liquor deal of Lester's Mason on the square. I was just busy. Just a minute. I'm not here about any liquor deal. This is murder. Huh? Murder? Yes, murder. Mrs. Maud Kennedy has been murdered. Oh, oh no. Oh, no. Oh, no. That, that ain't right. Nobody killed her. See, she was a swell woman. Hey, what are you trying to do, kid me? No, we don't kid about anything. This is serious. I want an answer from you, Riley, and I want it straight. Did you see Mrs. Kennedy on the night of August 31st? The, the, the 31st? The... Well, that was Thursday, wasn't it? No, I never saw her. You went over to her house, though. Huh? How'd you know? I didn't know. I just took a chance, and I was right, huh? Oh, so you're trying to frame me, huh? Sure, I went over but they never, I never killed her, and you know it. No, I don't know it. You'll have to have an airtight alibi if you want to get out of this thing. Listen, I never had much to do with it. On the square, I went over there on the night of the 31st. I phoned her about 7.15. 7.15? Yeah, yeah. She kept me along a while, and then she told me to come down to the house, and if I saw a light, burning to come in and see her. And did you go? Yeah, I, I waited outside the house for about an hour, but she didn't show up, so I walked... Back home and went to bed. Well, your story sounds pretty weak to me. I'm going to take you in until we've got time to investigate it. Oh, now, 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 listen. Now, now that's the honest truth, so help me. Ask my mother, ask my father, they'll tell you. They're church people. They ain't going to lie to you. You, you ain't going to hang this on. I'm innocent, they tell you. I, I tell you, I'm innocent. <laughs> Kid Riley is brought in and questioned, but he proves an airtight alibi. So the investigation drags on. Suspect after suspect is taken to headquarters, questioned and freed. Normandy, the border of Mrs. Kennedy, skips off the police to another prize fighter who is friendly with the murdered woman. This man, located in Fresno, where he was facing a bogus sex charge, is brought back to Los Angeles. He places suspicion on Normandy, claiming that the border had torn some of Mrs. Kennedy's diamonds. Questioned again, Normandy reluctantly explains that Mrs. Kennedy was an avid poker player and that she sometimes covered her losses by pawning her diamonds. Then, out of the welter of fruitless questioning and worthless clues, emerges the name of Percy Tugwell. It is discovered that Tugwell had borrowed five dollars from Mrs. Kennedy the day of her death. Captain Wynn questions the manager of the garage where Tugwell was known to loaf. Yeah, price hung around here, but he ain't here now. Where is he? He got married. He's in Cisco on his honeymoon. I didn't know he could afford a trip like that. Neither did I. He ain't worked for a year. And then a couple of days ago, he shows up with a pair of tickets to Cisco, and he tells me he's gone and got hit. I don't know where he got that now. The trail 
still grows warm as Captain Wynn interviews a neighbor of the Tugwell. Well, I ain't one to carry tales, Captain, but there's some funny business about that Tugwell boy. Why, I heard it direct from Alice Carter, who boards with the Tugwells, that Percy asked her sweetheart to sell a diamond for him. When was this? Uh, just the day after Mrs. Kennedy was murdered. Asked him to sell a diamond, huh? Yes, it was unmounted. And Percy said that it belonged to his fiance. He got $52 for it, so Alice says. Know anything more about this? No, oh, that's about all. Of course, I could tell you plenty about the family. But you well, thanks, know... I think I'll talk to them myself. <laughs> Captain Wynn and Lieutenant Holmes interview the entire Tugwell family. Their stories are the same. Well, Mr. Tugwell, can you tell us what your son's movements were on the night of August the 31st? Uh, why, why, yes. He and Thelma, his girl, was here for supper. Uh, and after supper, they had a little argument because uh, Percy wanted to go out to the garage and say goodbye to the gang. And Thelma said that he, that he cared more for the gang than he did for her anyway, uh, uh, Percy went. What time was that? Uh, about 7 o'clock, I should say. And what time did he get back? I guess it was long, about uh, about 8.30, no later. He comes back in and film and him patch up their little spat. Where is Percy staying in San Francisco? Uh, uh, I, I think he's at the Bayview Hotel. Mm, very well, Mr. Dugwell. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, not at all. Uh, but would you mind telling me what all this your question's all about? Oh, we're just trying to complete a report, Mr. Dugwell. Good night. Well, mother, sister, brother, and father all tell the same story. Yeah. If I tell them the truth, I think to eliminate Tugwell. If Mr. Kennedy, Mrs. Kennedy was murdered at 9 o'clock and he was back home at 8.30, he's got a pretty tight alibi. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. When you consider that the scene of the murder must be five miles from the Tugwell house. Just the same. I want to talk to this Tugwell. You better leave for Frisco tonight and bring him back with you. All right. In the meantime, I'm going to see if any of the streetcar conductors who are working West Jefferson on the night of the murder can identify this picture, Tugwell, we get from the family. With home on the trail of Tugwell in San Francisco, Wynn interviews the streetcar conductors. You were working on the West Jefferson between the hours of 7 and 9 on the night of August the 31st? Yes, sir. Do you recognize the man in this picture as one of the passengers we carried that night? Oh, let me see. No, no, I don't think so. I never saw him before, huh? Mm, nope, I never did. All right, that's all. Thanks for coming in. You're welcome, Captain. Well, we're not getting any place in this line. That's the 15th conductor. Thank you. Big pardon, Captain. Telegram, sir. Well, thanks, Captain. Probably from Lieutenant Holman, Captain, too, so. For the love of Pete. What is it? Listen to this. Place a man in the home of Mr. and Mrs. Philip Kennedy. They're accused of being involved in the murder. We'll arrive in Los Angeles with Percy Tugwell in the morning. Can you imagine that? But you can't go out and arrest them on a face all like that. I don't intend to. I'm going to call Lieutenant Home in San Francisco and find out what this is all about. <laughs> From Lieutenant Holm in San Francisco, Captain Wynn gets the details of Tugwell's accusation. Equipped with his information, he and an assistant preach for the Kennedy home. Philip Kennedy admits them. Oh, good evening, Captain. Come in. Hey. Are there uh, any any developments in the case? Here's Mr. Kennedy. There are. Is your wife here and Mr. Normandy? Yes, they're here. I'd like to talk to them, too. Very well, I'll, I'll, I'll get them. Hello. Captain Wynn wants to see you and Bert for a minute. Will you come in? Thank you. Good evening, Captain. Good evening, Good evening. Captain. Good evening. Now that the three of you are here, I regret to inform you that I have to place you under arrest. Oh, yes? On what charge? Suspicion of murder. What? That's ridiculous. Who made this charge? Percy Tugwell. Tugwell? Tugwell was arrested in San Francisco today and will be here in the morning. Then we can clear this thing up. In the meantime, I'll have to place an officer here. But how could Tugwell implicate us? He claims that on the night of Mrs. Kennedy's death, he called here. During his visit, you two gentlemen became involved in a fight. Mrs. Kennedy, according to his story, in attempting to separate you, was knocked unconscious. Why, that's ridiculous. Then your wife here, attempting to resuscitate her, gave an overdose of ammonia, causing her death. Why, well, that's preposterous. Well, that's your story. Then he said that you, Mr. Kennedy, had forced Mr. Normandy and himself to take the body to the vacant lot where it was found. But his share in disposing of the body... He says he was given a diamond. Well, that story is so fantastic, Captain, that it seems ridiculous to attempt to refute it. You've already got our statements. They're true. I didn't see Tugwell here the night of Mrs. Kennedy's death. 
Nor did I see him the next day. There was no fight and no one administered ammonia in my presence. Percy Tugwell is a miserable liar. I want to meet him face to face and dare him to try and lay a suspicion of murder against my husband. Has Philip loved his mother better than anything on earth? Believe him in me. Tugwell's trying to lay the blame on us because he's guilty himself. Back to Los Angeles, Percy Tugwell reiterates his version of the murder. Police doubt his preposterous story. Deputy District Attorney Joseph Ford attempts to break down Tugwell's statement. For five hours, Tugwell is questioned. And then he finally admits, uh, I come to you. I lured her to that vacant lot and cured her with chloroform. I told her I had some perfume and asked her if she wanted to smell it. When she took the bottle, I grabbed her by the throat and forced her to swallow the contents. I wanted to get married, and I needed the money to finance my honeymoon. Tugwell's given something to eat and sent to bed. Next morning, he sends for the detectives and repudiates his confession of the night before. Bill Kennedy killed his mother. I confessed last night to shield him. Why should I take the rap for him? <laughs> she sent me a note on the evening of her death, and I met him on the West Jefferson Street car and got off at Sixth Avenue. We met his mother and Bill killed her. I got a diamond for my share. There's no doubt in the world that Tugwell was guilty. The only question is whether Philip Kennedy was in on the deal. Personally, I doubt it. Let's bring the two of them face to face. That's a good idea. All right, Pogo. I want to repeat your statement before Mr. Kennedy here. Well, Bill here sent me a note and I met him on the Jefferson Street car. We met his mother at the corner of 6th Avenue. Still killed her, and I got a diamond. Well, lie, I... Tugwell. You never saw me out there. Tell the truth. Tell the truth. Wait a minute. Take it out of here. Wait a minute. What are you trying? You're accusing me of killing my own mother. Pull yourself together, Kennedy. Take him out, will you, John? Faced by Philip's wife and Normandy, who repeats her previous testimony, Tugwell begins to weaken. Finally, he speaks to Lieutenant Holmes. I want to tell the truth, Lieutenant. If I do, it means the rope to someone. Well, you better get it off your conscience, Tugwell. You'll feel a lot better if you do. Then bring Phil back. Okay. Mr. Kennedy, will you come in, please? Tugwell has something to say, Mr. Kennedy. He wants you to hit it. I did it, so I want to apologize. Will you shake my hand? Why, you... Philip Kennedy, his wife, and De Normandy were released immediately from custody. And four months and a half after Mrs. Kennedy's death, Tugwell went on trial in Superior Court. The jury, after five-hour deadlock, returned a verdict of guilty, and Tugwell was sentenced to life imprisonment in San Quentin Penitentiary. Thank you, Chief Figure. Ladies and gentlemen, among the boys and girls listening tonight, thousands have joined the Junior Police Department and are now wearing police badges, carrying handcuffs, fire and whistles, and guns. Many have detective fingerprint outfits, microscopes, and other valuable articles, all given away free by the Rio Grande Oil Company. We invite every boy and girl listening who has not already joined to go at once to the service station in your neighborhood featuring Rio Grande cracked gasoline. Ask for a free copy of the Calling All Cars News. You will find the 14 free gifts illustrated there, and you will learn how you can get the complete junior detective outfit absolutely free. Every motorist can help some boy or girl get these valuable gifts merely by using Rio Grande cracked gasoline, the same gasoline that's used by the police cars, the ambulances, the fire engines, and other emergency equipment of the leading cities and counties in the West. Drive into the Rio Grande station. 
get a tank full of police car performance. And if you're going to enjoy the full thrill of greater speed, faster acceleration, and instantaneous starting, protect your engine with Sinclair motor oil. All Rio Grande dealers feature Sinclair oils because they can guarantee it. No matter how fast you go, Sinclair motor oil guarantees you perfect lubrication. All wax, petroleum jelly, impurities have been extracted. No matter how much you pay, you can't possibly buy better motor oil than Sinclair. And your Rio Grande dealer has it as low as 25 cents a quart. Frederick Lindsay. 